Happy Wednesday to you all. Pastor Matt here once again to bring you a lesson out of God's Word. We are, we are continuing our Wednesday night study on uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, last week we began um, we began looking at the, the Holy Spirit uh, as a um, as the third person of the Trinity. We've looked at the, the Father, the Father is God, the, the Jesus Christ is God, uh, and now we're looking at the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, specifically, we're looking that he is a person, because if we're going to establish the Trinity, we need to understand that it is three persons, one God. And once again, that is very difficult to uh, process and comprehend. It, you know, the more that you think about it, the harder it becomes. Uh, but we, we understand what the scriptures say. It affirms the fact that all three of these are persons, and it affirms the fact that all three are God, and it affirms the fact that all three are one. Uh, so th those are, are basically the three main critical points when we're looking at the doctrine of the Trinity is um, is, uh, is those three things, that each is a person, that each is God, and that the three are one. Once again, I can't comprehend it, but the Word of God is very clear on it, and I believe it, okay? So um, we're continuing with the Holy Spirit. We're continuing with that the Holy Spirit is a person. Tonight we start with uh, that he relates to the Father and Son as a person. And uh, pretty well all of the scriptures that we see in regard to this have to do with, or, or what we see is that the three are mentioned together frequently and on equal plane. Uh, they don't always have the same work. They often do different works in, in response to man. You know, you see evidence even in creation that uh, each person of the Trinity had a different uh, role in creation. Um, you know, it says after that, uh, uh, that the creation was made, that the, that the Holy Spirit brooded or hovered above the face of the earth, and, and, and that, uh, that he had a very specific role within creation. But all three were there at creation, and all things that were created were created by them. We certainly see that of Jesus Christ, but it's certainly uh, regarding the Father and the Holy Spirit as well. We'll eventually look at some of those things regarding the Holy Spirit in particular, such as creation. But I, what I wanted to bring out is the relation that we see throughout the scriptures of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That they are mentioned alone. There is no one else as a person mentioned together in the same way with them. Uh, and they are looked at in an equal plane. So these, these are some of the passages that show that the Holy Spirit relates to the Father and the Son as a spirit, uh, as a person. Excuse me. Uh, Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, uh, here we have uh, the portion of the Great Commission. Uh, the uh, the third part of the Great Commission, after we make the disciples, baptizing them, what do we do then? We make uh, we teach them to observe all all things. Um, excuse me, that uh, I'm mistaken. That's that's later on in the passage, but um, we see here in particular that the baptism. How do we baptize? We bap we baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Why those names? Uh, why only those names and why those names at all? Why not just the Father if the Father is only God? Or why not just the Son if the, if the Son is only God? There are other religions uh, out there that claim Christianity, but they will only baptize in the name of Jesus, for example. And we're told very clearly to baptize in the name of all three. And so uh, the Holy Ghost has authority on the same lines I beg your pardon, as the Father and the Son. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, for, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Uh, so um, Paul speaking here, Paul often uh, put the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost on the same plane in his writings. Uh, even this, this as a sign-off for this letter, uh, you know, he puts, puts them all together, keeps these names in particular in mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, uh, Paul once again uh, in his previous letter says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. And so looking at the spiritual gifts as we see here, um, which we know are ended, but they did exist at one time, uh, specifically to show the power of God for those that proclaim Jesus Christ to the world while the word of God was still being completed. Uh, each had a role and uh, in regard to giving these gifts to uh, men. Um, and we see the equality of all three and the relation of all three uh, to man, uh, each as a person. First Peter chapter one, verses one and two, uh, says Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multi multiplied. So <clears throat> uh, we see even Peter here, excuse me. Peter, who, you know, that there's a lot to be said about Paul. His apostleship is in question. In fact, my dad has a lifelong friend that um, is a uh, Jewish rabbi and he has studied much of the New Testament and he calls into question um, the, uh, the apostleship of the Apostle Paul. And so uh, there is something, uh, you know, it, Paul's apostleship is in question, even though Paul, Peter himself aligned the writings of Paul with the rest of scripture but they're saying the same thing here. That's what I'm trying to get to, is both Paul and Peter are recognizing the equality in, and interrelation of all three persons of the Trinity. And we see here, in, in terms of election, uh, we see the Father, the Spirit, and the Son, all three. And final point in this, uh, in this regard uh, is in Jude, uh, chapter 1, which there is only one chapter, but Jude verses 20 and 21 says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And once again, when, when you see the different persons of the Trinity, and one of them is called God, that is reference the Father. It's not excluding the deity of the Son or of the Holy Spirit, but uh, God the Father is the first person of the Trinity. Uh, the Spirit and the Son are both made subject to him, not because of equality, um, but uh, for the sake of uh, how they relate to man, and especially in regard to salvation and their, their different roles, but uh, we still see all three here. So when it says the love of God, it refers to the Father. And of course, we see the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ uh, mentioning uh, mentioning that. And um, uh, recently, we looked at um, the idea of, of the, uh, in regard to the Holy Spirit, that he, he makes intercession on our behalf in regard to our prayers. He takes our prayers on our behalf and brings them before the Father because we don't know what we ought to pray. Um, we ought to pray, but we don't know what, what we ought to pray. Okay, so when he says praying in the Holy Ghost, uh, it's not, you know, some might suggest that it's, 
you know, speaking in tongues and in a, in a language only God can understand. No, it means that the Holy Ghost is making intercession on our behalf uh, regarding our prayers, okay? The next point in regard to the fact, uh, actually, this is the last point in regard to the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person, is that he is treated personally. And take, pay close attention to these different uh, points that we're going to look at here. Um, okay, so he's treated personally. First of all, he can be tempted or tested, right? And that means to, you know, basically put to the test. Acts 5, 9, then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of God, or Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Okay, so this chapter, uh, Acts chapter 5, actually, in regard to um, Ananias and Sapphira, who were children of God, and they were uh, members of the local New Testament church there in Jerusalem, uh, and, and because of the needs of the congregation then and there through hardship, uh, the church had decided, uh, not compulsory, but uh, through their own volunteering, to sell off many of their own properties and goods, and that they would bring together all of the all of their money so that it can be dispersed. Uh, among um, those that had greater need. Now, you know, uh, this is not this is not intended to be political, but he's not talking about socialism here. Socialism is compulsory, and it's forced by an uh, a government. You're talking about a local body of believers. Uh, there wasn't a tremendous amount of them in relation to, uh, you know, the rest of those around them, and it just had to do with that there was a particular need. Uh, they were they were not a free country. They were still under Roman control and rule. Had to pay taxes, often unfairly, uh, and they saw a lot of persecution. You know, those early Christians started to see a lot of persecution, not from the Romans, uh, but certainly from the Jews. And so, um, or not only from the Romans. I I uh, should clarify. Uh, and, you know, some of those hardships would have been financial in nature. And so they, as a church body, uh, decided that they would seek to do this. And everyone volunteered to do this. And only those who only those who made promises participated. And it looked like pretty well everyone had participated. And what happened was Ananias and Sapphira had made the promise that they were going to sell a piece of property and contribute all of that money to the church. And instead, they lied about how much they got and gave only half of it. Uh, and it wasn't the fact that they held back half of it, it's that they uh, lied to the church and, and by virtue of what uh, Peter says, that they lied to the Holy Spirit himself, um, concerning that. And as a result, the Lord took their lives. They were done. Now, I mean, they were, by all, by all indications, they were safe people. So that meant that uh, they were to go to be in the presence of God. Uh, so ultimately, it, it, you know, the best for them was up to come, but they would have to answer for those things uh, be before him. And they were, they didn't have the opportunity to be able to fulfill God's purpose in their lives, which is the most critical thing that we can do on this earth. That is why we're here. God has a purpose for us in this uh, in this life. It's not to be it's not to be be the most successful in our careers. Uh, it's not to be the wealthiest. It's not to have the nicest homes. It's not to have the best cars. It's not to have um, you know a great family. You know to to have thousands, you know, tons of friends or, or whatever. That's not what, what it's about. It's about fulfilling the design and purpose that God has put in our, our lives. And so for the fact that they, they died, yes, they went to be with them, but they were going to have to answer for that. And they couldn't fulfill uh, his purpose because they had lied to God, lied to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and 
I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going off on a tangent there, but that's to give a little bit of background of what we're talking about in this passage, um, because in what they did, they tempted or tested the Holy Spirit, kind of like a, a young child, you know, when a, when a parent puts uh, restrictions and boundaries um, for their children, for their good and for their safety, and a, and a child starts to push those boundaries to see how far they can actually get. You know, the best parents are going to ensure those boundaries through discipline. And so they thought that they could push it, hold back some of their own money that they had already promised. And if they only promised half, so be it. That's what they promised, but that's not what it's about. And, you know, because uh, making promises, keeping promises, uh, or, or vows, you, if you look in the scriptures, God is very serious about keeping your promises, about being true to your word, uh, it, because that's exactly who he is. That's exactly what he expects of us. He is a God of truth, and we, uh, as his own creation, and then uh, being redeemed, redeemed to him, we need to be children of God in so far as we demonstrate uh, that we are true to our word, okay? So they, uh, by their action uh, in this way, they tested the Holy Spirit. He can be lied to. He can be lied to. The same passage, just a little previous, a little earlier in verse 3, says, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? And um, just for further proof that the Holy Spirit is God, there's another part in this passage that says, you have not lied unto man, but unto God. Um, so he, they lied to the Holy Spirit. They lied to God. Okay. Um, all right. He can be grieved. He can be grieved or, or made uh, distressed is another word we might use. Ephesians 4.30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And then also in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10, it says, but they rebelled and vexed, that's that same word, grieved or distressed, his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. What, what non-person can be grieved. You know, there's a lot of attempts to uh, make robots more lifelike. You know, they create the AI, the artificial intelligence to uh, replicate human emotion if possible. Um, but here's the thing is nobody expects them to be real. Nobody expects them to somehow come to a place of self-awareness that, that they can think for themselves. They think according to how they're programmed. And anything new that they take just comes into their programming. Okay, they are not, robots are not persons. They don't have that person put and they cannot be grieved, right? Holy Spirit is not just some force. He is a person, he can be grieved. He can be resisted. Acts chapter seven, verse 51, he's stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. He can be insulted. We can insult the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, it says, how, Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy? who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite, or despised, or caused to be insulted. That's what that word means there. Unto the Spirit of grace. Okay, so he's calling out um, the, the sin of rejecting the gift of God, the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ uh, that was sacrificed and to despise 
the Holy Spirit. How do we despise the Holy Spirit? We reject his movings. And there's going to be plenty of people who have been under conviction. They have felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, come to me. And they have rejected that. Why? Because they love darkness rather than light. That's what it comes down to. There are a lot of people out there, especially those that say that they're atheists, not as much the agnostics. Those that are agnostics are not at a place where they uh, are willing to acknowledge or, or that they acknowledge that there can be no God. And they're usually far more open to uh, the possibility, although they tend towards thinking maybe there isn't a God. There are some that are agnostic that, that believe that there is some sort of a God, but they just don't know who he is. Okay. You know what? God can work with a person like that who says, I, I believe there's a God, but I don't know who he is, or I'm not sure if there's a God, but I'm open to it. That's great. You know, the Bible says, taste and see that I am good. You know, he says, if you, uh, you will, if you search for me, you will find me. If you search for me with your whole heart, God does not reject those who, uh, who will, seek for him even if they haven't found him yet but there are far more people who have felt the convicting power of the holy spirit and it draws them but they are fighting tooth and nail to stay away from that because they hate the idea of god even though they don't really know who he is you know they, they may be atheists but only in regard to what they think they know about god you know, the, the picture of God that's been painted for them or that they've painted for themselves, you know, they, they hate that. They really don't know the true God and understand his ways. Um, but for those that have felt a convicting power of the Holy Spirit, who have get, been given an opportunity, who have heard the gospel, if they reject Christ and they reject the moving of the Holy Spirit, they were they will be, they will be, um, responsible for their own uh for their own rejection okay he can be blasphemed blasphemed okay now blasphemed uh the word itself um slandered to to be brought down with words in other words it's, that's kind of what it is in reference to god you know that we saw you know why was christ condemned at least why did they say he was condemned to die on the cross, it was because of blasphemy. And they say he blasphemes, making himself God. That's what they claimed about Jesus Christ. Well, he proved he was God. He showed that they had the power of God, which gave power to the message that he spoke. What was the message that he spoke? That, that he was the son of God, and that through him, salvation would come. Okay. They rejected him just on the basis that he said he was God. But they didn't know the scriptures. They didn't know uh, the scriptures, okay? So now we see blasphemy as it applies to the Holy Ghost, okay? Matthew 12, 31 and 32. Matthew 12, 31 and 32, which says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men, what we might call the one unforgivable sin. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And this is, this is a, a challenging passage, and I'm not, uh, I'm not going to try to get into explaining it. I'll be honest. It's one that, that I'm still seeking out uh, what it, it really means. You know, and the best explanation that I have heard is that blaspheming against the Holy Ghost uh, basically equates to refusing uh, his power in your life that comes by way of conviction, especially to accept Jesus Christ. And when you reject that conviction uh, your whole life to the point of death, then you are held responsible. You will not be forgiven. Okay. Um, but the fact that he can be blasphemed, Right, what blaspheme has to has to do with, um, you know, the uh, the name that to uh, slander him, to speak ill of him. Okay, 
why would you do that with anything that is that is not a person? Once again, I mean, I, I think of when I think of something that has appears to be a person but is not like a robot. If you insult a robot, you're not actually insulting the robot. You're insulting the creator, the programmer of that robot, right? Um, and so you can't blaspheme a robot. You can blaspheme a person and the Holy Spirit being able to be blasphemed um, is a person. He is distinguished from his own power. And what that means is one of the views about the Holy Spirit is that uh, the Holy Spirit is viewed as a representation of power from God. Not that, that he is a person, but that he is a, a, an exhibition, I guess you could say, of God's power in particular ways. Okay? Uh, it indicates that he is not just a demonstration of the power of the Father, but is a person with his own power. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing, all that were oppressed for uh, oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Okay, so how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power. Okay, there's a distinction between the power of God uh, and the Holy Ghost here. Romans 15, 13. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope, through the power of the Holy Ghost. Fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So he has his own power. Okay, so if, if he is a power uh, or a demonstration of the power of the Father, then he shouldn't have his own power, but you see that he has his own power. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech... And my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Okay, uh, and showing these things through the word shows that the Holy Spirit is indeed an individual person, not merely a specific influence of God. Okay, he's not just, first of all, God is not multi-personality, and he doesn't have disassociative identity disorder um, to where he changes his personality depending on how he relates to man. Um, all three exist simultaneously. And he is not just a demonstration of the power of the Father. He has his own person. He has his own power. And we can relate to him as a person. He relates to us as a person. He relates to the other persons of the Trinity as a person. Okay. Uh, moving on to a new subject, we're moving away from looking at him as a person. We looked into uh, specifically his deity. Okay. Just because we prove he is a person doesn't prove he is deity. It just shows that he is distinct from the Father and the Son. Now we're going to look at his deity specifically, and we're going to start with the attributes of deity that are affirmed in him. First of all, he is eternal, right? There's, there's kind of the big four, he, uh, eternality, omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. That what, that's what we're looking at with, with all of these. We, we definitely looked at that with, with Jesus Christ, okay? So in order for someone to be God, they have to demonstrate those, okay? Uh, Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Interestingly enough, here, here we see another example of all three persons of the Trinity in one passage. But specifically, um, the writer of the book of Hebrews, who is not known, it's often attributed to the, the Apostle Paul, could be, um, but we don't see uh, a personal address in the beginning of the book like we do with Paul's other, other letters. Um, but whoever did write it indicated that the spirit was eternal. Okay, that, I mean, we just have it in, in his description, the eternal spirit. 
He is omniscient. Omniscient means all knowing. Uh, a couple examples, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Okay, so um, the Spirit reveals to us the deep things of God. That can only be to a saved individual, right? He's talking about uh, things that are spiritually discerned, uh, that only those in whom uh, the Spirit of God dwells uh, can come to know the things of God at all. And so, um, okay, and he knows the deep things. He knows the things of God, uh, which if there was anything that was very lofty to know it would be the things of god but the spirit knows those things right he is god okay uh john 14 26 but the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever i have said unto you okay so in response to jesus leaving Right? He was preparing his disciples for his own, his own ascension. He says, if I leave, I'm, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit, the comfort of the Paracletos, when he came um, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, we also see that he breathed on them to receive the Holy Spirit prior to that. Those are two separate occasions, uh, indwelling and uh, the, the baptism or the empowering of the church through the Holy Spirit. Um, Okay, so if he would come, he would be the paracletos, that comforter, and he will teach you all things. That's one of his roles, is to teach uh, all things to his disciples. Okay, whatever I've commanded to you, or whatever, whatever I've said unto you, as it says here. In order for him to teach all things, he has to know all things. Okay, uh, and then again in John 16, and verses 12 through 13, it says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Albeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Okay. He is also, where did it go? Omnipotent. Okay. Uh, omni, omni means all potent, as you might think as you might understand, means powerful, he is all-powerful, okay? Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 35 says, And the angel answered and said unto her, uh, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high, highest shall overshadow thee. Uh, therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, it's not a, an exclusive um, look at his omnipotence, you know, it doesn't say, uh, not exclusive, explicit, I should say. Uh, example or declaration of his omnipotence, but by, by what he accomplished in this context, you can see that he is all-powerful, right? What did he accomplish? He, what we're talking about is the, the virgin conception uh, of Jesus Christ. Right? He did not have an earthly father. Uh, God sent his spirit. Uh, the Spirit came and overshadowed Mary, and um, and uh, she became pregnant uh, as a result of the Holy Spirit coming upon her in a way that defied all nature. It, it was, you know, that's that was a very significant thing. You know, it was a sign uh, that we saw from the Old Testament: a virgin shall conceive. Right? Well, how do you do that when a virgin is not able to conceive? You know, uh, only uh, as far as earthly means are possible, it takes a man and a woman in order to uh, conceive. Here she was, uh, she conceived, and it was uh, because the Holy Spirit came uh, upon her. And he is omnipresent. Psalm 139, 7 through 12. This one is a little clearer, in my opinion. Uh, David speaking here, one of my favorites, probably my favorite song. One of my favorite passages of scriptures, 
It says, whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or wh whither means where? where? Where shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness as the light are all are both alike to thee. Okay, so obviously he's, he speaks of very specific places, but that's not saying those are the places that he can go and the Holy Spirit's there. It's suggesting there is no place where he can escape the Holy Spirit because he is always there. Where shall I go from thy spirit? And that concludes uh, this lesson. We'll continue on with the deity of the Holy Spirit uh, next time. And so, uh, you know, that it's if I were to ask you to sh share a scripture that showed to me that, you know, the deity of Jesus Christ, there is an abundance. There are far less concerning the Holy Ghost, but he's also uh, not nearly as often denied deity from people, right? It is, it does happen, and it needs to be understood that, um, that he is, in fact, deity. Um, you know, because what we're doing here and what we're trying to build here is, you know, an understanding for our personal reasons so that we can come to a better understanding of who God is, right? You know, one of our ultimate goals in this life is to, to come to know God, come to know God, come to know his power, come to know how he relates to us and our responsible responsibility to him on that basis. Um, and so these are things that are very critically important because if, if the spirit is God, then we need to learn who he is. We need to understand, uh, you know, how he relates to us as God. And then it gives us opportunity to be able to talk to people who are of, of other faiths, faith systems that are not true, that are heretical in a lot of their beliefs, uh, to get an opportunity to be able to share the truth of the gospel with them, right? Obviously, you know, we're not going to necessarily convince them of, of all of these heresies unless we first come to an understanding that they need to know Jesus Christ as Savior, because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, these things are spiritually discerned. So unless they have the Holy Spirit, they're not going to learn these things. And if they do, it is possible for someone who is saved to uh, go into error. It gives us an opportunity to show uh, the correction there. So we need to we need to learn these things as much as we can, um, so that our relationship with God will grow, and that we have opportunities to be able to um, apologetically minister to people for the sake of the gospel. Right? Apologetics. People think, oh, apologetics is not important. You just gotta. You just have to share the gospel. Well, what if there are barriers to sharing the gospel? Apologetics is to break down those barriers so that we can have an opportunity to share uh, Jesus Christ. And that's why we study uh, these things, okay? All right, so looking forward to next time. Thank you so much for your attention. I pray that God has blessed you as a result of this. Uh, God bless.